Zechariah. For those of you who are maybe a little unfamiliar with the Old Testament, uh, the book of Zechariah is the second to the last book of the Old Testament. But for those of you that hand, were handed a Bible, one of the ones that we hand out, you'll find it on page 462. So there's a little bit of a cheat, but that'll get you there. There's another book called Zephaniah. Where that's not where we're going. We're going to Zechariah. And we're going to be talking here about what happened on Palm Sunday. I want to revisit some of the prophecies about Jesus from that day. Because, you know, we, we come to Paul Sunday, Palm Sunday. How many of you, when you were kids, used to go around the Sunday school area, you know, waving palm branches? I did when I was a kid. And, uh, of course, we'd use them to hit the girls and stuff. And, but, um, and a sword fight with the guys. But Palm Sunday was always just commemorating the day that Jesus came into the city riding on a donkey. And we know that there were all these songs that had to do with Hosanna and this and that. And we'd sing them and go through. The, and that's really kind of what it was all about. As I learned more about what Palm Sunday is in, in the years that followed and after I started walking with the Lord... I realized that Palm Sunday was this incredible prophetic watershed event that really leads to the prophetic insights about his second coming. And that's what's really interesting. And that's one of the reasons I'm having you go to the book of Zechariah. First of all, Zechariah is quoted by Matthew. You know, Matthew was there when Jesus came into the city. And, and uh, that, that day on, on Palm Sunday, which really began what we call that Passion Week before the crucifixion. And Matthew saw this event. And when he wrote it down in his gospel account, he actually quoted Zechariah, which we're going to be looking at today, because he saw in Zechariah uh, a, a fulfillment of what was taking place. In fact, let me, let me show you on the screen how Matthew kind of gives it to us in chapter 21. He says, now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. He goes on to say, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, and here he's quoting Zechariah, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Before we get any further, let's pray. Father God, open our hearts to the ministry of of your word and teach us today. We long to learn and grow and have greater understanding of these things. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now that we've looked at this historical event from Matthew's perspective, again, he was an eyewitness of all these things. And we've looked at this prophecy that he quotes from the book of Zechariah. We now find ourselves here in the book of Zechariah, and I'm going to have you start off in chapter 9. So turn over, please, to chapter 9. Let me, let me just, before we start reading, set this up for you just a little bit. Because Zechariah wrote these prophecies down at a time when Israel was actually still in exile in the Babylonian kingdom. It's interesting that we're actually talking about those very events on our Wednesday study right now through Jeremiah. And you, you, because of their idolatry, God raised up the Babylonian army to come and conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel had been, the northern kingdom had been conquered long before, but the southern kingdom of Judah still existed. The Babylonian army came and conquered the southern kingdom, 
broke down the walls, broke down, destroyed the temple, destroyed much of the city, took, killed many of the people, and took the rest of them essentially into exile in the Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah had prophesied saying that they would be there for a period of 70 years. All right. Now, Zechariah is writing right toward the end of that 70-year period. He was a contemporary of the prophet Haggai. Now, so Israel is about to be released from their Babylonian exile. And this is, just to let you know, written down about 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that gives you a sense of where we are. Now, it is in chapter 9, and then skip down to verse 9, that we read the verse that Matthew quoted. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. <clears throat> Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. Now, this is a, this, is a, this is a great prophecy. As I said, 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. But what this prophecy is about, of course, and why it is so important, is because Palm Sunday was the very first time in Jesus' public ministry that he allowed his followers to publicly declare him Messiah. Prior to this time when he did a miracle, he'd always be telling people, don't tell anybody. Don't, you, you know, go show yourself to the priest, but don't tell. They did anyway, but he didn't want, he wasn't ready for that public announcement to be made. The public announcement came on Palm Sunday, and you'll notice that the people cried out saying, Son of David. Remember, that was a messianic term, all right? To call someone the son of David was to say, you are Messiah in this particular instance. That's why the religious leaders got so upset about what the people were saying. In fact, they went to Jesus, you'll remember, and they said, tell your followers to be quiet. They're calling you the son of David. They're calling you the Messiah. Tell them to stop. Jesus said, no, no can do. And you remember how all that sort of a situation went. So what's particularly interesting, historically speaking, is that the prophecy of Zechariah related to Palm Sunday said, Behold, your king is coming. Did you read that? It's right there in verse 9. Behold, your king is coming. Now I want you to remember something. Zechariah is prophesying these words right toward the end of the 70-year exile. They don't have a king. There is no king. The last king was a guy named Zedekiah, total loser. And even though he was a son of David, he was, a, he was an evil king, and, and God took him off the throne and took the people off into exile. Do you know that after the people came back from exile, they never again had a king? They had governors, and they were appointed by the nations that conquered them. But Israel never again had a king. To this day, they have not had a king ruling and reigning on the throne of David, okay? So you need to understand that. And yet, Ze uh, Zechariah says, behold, your king is coming. Well, now, wait a second here. How can that be when we know historically, after the uh, exile, Israel essentially had no king? Well, you'll remember when Jesus came along, that subject of whether or not he was a king uh, created kind of a tense conversation between himself and Pontius Pilate. Do you remember that? It's actually recorded for us in the book of John. Let me put it on the screen for you. It says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? That was the question of the hour because, of course, it would be treason if he claimed to be an earthly king. And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So 
in one sense, Zechariah was right when he said, behold, your king is coming because Jesus is a king, but not at this point in his earthly appearance, a physical king. Jesus never sat on a physical throne in Jerusalem in his first coming, right? So this prophecy is only applicable from the standpoint that Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, is the king or is a king of another kingdom. But here's the deal. Zechariah is going to go on in this very set of prophecies here, and we're going to bounce around in the book of Zechariah because these prophecies are not in chronological order. I'm going to try to put them in some chron chronological order. But Zechariah is going to go on and talk about the kingship of Messiah. In fact, we just read verse 9 of chapter 9, right? Look at verse 10. This is amazing. He says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he, who's he? The one that Zechariah is talking about. Behold, your king is coming. He shall speak peace to the nations. Look at this. Look at this. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, this is crazy. Right here in the book of Zechariah, he prophesies the, in the first coming of Jesus how he's going to come into the city on a donkey. But then, very next verse, he's talking about the fact that he's going to rule the world. Has that happened yet? It has not. It has not happened yet. This is a prophecy. We just, we just jumped from the first coming of Jesus to a second coming. Within just the context of two verses, we jumped from first to, to second coming. And so these prophecies, or this prophecy here in verse 10, is about the physical rule of Jesus Christ that is coming to this earth when he comes a second time. Now, to learn more about his second coming, we go to the 12th chapter of Zechariah. So turn with me to chapter 12 in your Bible. Zechariah chapter 12, and we're going to look at the first three verses. It goes like this. The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples, the siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. And look at this. And all the nations will gather against it. All right. Now here, Zechariah is foretelling a time in the future of a great conflict on the earth. And Jerusalem is going to be at the center of that conflict. Now what we've done is we've just, we're, now we're talking about that period of time called the Great Tribulation. And during the Great Tribulation, Israel is going to be considered, Jerusalem is going to be considered a heavy stone. And, and, and those who try to lift it and those who try to do things to Jerusalem at first are going to be hurt it says they will hurt themselves. So what are they going to do? The nations of the world are going to gather against it. They're going to come en masse. And they're going to attack Jerusalem and all of the southern kingdom of Judah. And so there's going to be this war. And that's what we're told at the very end of verse 3. Did you see that? Look again at the very end of verse 3. It says, all the nations of the earth will gather against it. Now, people... That hasn't happened yet because we're not in the Great Tribulation. A lot of people thought we were when the pandemic hit. If I had a dollar for everybody who wrote me and asked if we were in the Great Tribulation because of the pandemic, I'd be a very wealthy person. We are not, all right? Uh, the Antichrist has not revealed himself. And there's a lot of other stuff. And besides, we're still here. So no, we are not in the Great Tribulation. But in that period of time known as the Great Tribulation, Toward the end of that seven-year period, all the nations of the world are going to gather against Jerusalem. And they are going to mount a huge war. Now, here's the deal. 
Jesus actually spoke about this. He talked about it when he was discoursing on coming events on the Mount of Olives. In fact, we call it the Olivet Discourse. And it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 24. Let me put it on the screen. We can read it together. Jesus said this, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and that is essentially when the Antichrist puts his image in the temple and demands the worship of all people on the earth. That's called the abomination of desolation, all right? He says, when you see that standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. Look how he describes that tribulation. Such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, and that's referring to the elect Jews, those days will be cut short. This prophecy the, in the Olivet Discourse is given to Israel. And this is about the Great Tribulation when the nations of the world will amass and come against Israel to destroy her. You know, they want to do it now. Mo a lot, well, not all of them. There are nations right now in the world that are allies with Israel, but there's a great many nations there in the Middle East that want nothing more that, but to wipe Israel off the map. In fact, some of them, that's their, that's their sworn desire. We will obliterate Israel. Well, that's going to grow and grow during the Great Tribulation period so that all the nations of the earth are going to gather together under a great deception to destroy uh, all of Israel. Now, as we go back to Zechariah here, chapter I'm going to have you turn to chapter 14 this time, okay? It's the last chapter of Zechariah we begin to learn about this battle, this battle uh, between the Jews, Jerusalem essentially, Israelites, and the nations who come to gather against her prophetically. <clears throat> and start with me uh, in verse 2, Zechariah 14, 2. It says, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the house is plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So what does that sound like to you as we finish there at the end of verse 2? Sounds like things are going to be very desperate for the people of Jerusalem, does it not? The, the, the nations are going to come against Jerusalem, and they're going to be able to get in. They're going to get into the city. They're going to destroy things. They're going to kill people. Women are going to be abused. It's, it's going to be horrible horrible time for them, but something big happens. Look at verse three. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Guys, we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. This is the second coming of Jesus. All right. Verse four. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Guess who those holy ones are? That's another word for saints. It's not just talking about angels, guys. The church returns with Jesus. His bride and the church is the bride of Christ. Returns with the Lord when he comes back which is kind of exciting when you stop and think about it. But you look at, we're even told in this prophecy where Jesus is going to touch down. Did you catch that? He said in verse 4, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. You know what's interesting about that? 
That's exactly where he ascended from. Jesus took his disciples, walked up to the Mount of Olives. This is post-resurrection, right? And while he's talking to them, suddenly he's lifted up in a cloud, and the disciples are looking up. They're trying to get one last glimpse, and suddenly these angels appear, and they say, Men of Israel, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens for this same Jesus who was taken from you will return just as you have seen him go. Not just in a cloud, but to the same place, to the Mount of Olives. Isn't that amazing? But what's really cool about this is we get to come back with him, as it says there at the very end. The Lord will come and all the holy ones with him. So the next question we have to ask is, how are the Jews going to react? You know that by and large, the Jews essentially rejected Jesus when he came the first time. Yeah, there were some Jews and they made up the first church, but they began to evangelize. And the number of Jews in the church after probably the end of the first century was very small by comparison. It was mostly Gentiles. Primarily, the Jews rejected their own Messiah the first time he came. So how are they going to receive him when he comes a second time? Well, remember on Palm Sunday, he came on a donkey this time he's coming in a very different manner, and the Jews are going to respond very differently to him. Go back to chapter 12 in Zechariah. Okay, you're going back a couple of pages. Chapter 12, and now skip down to verse 10. Zechariah 12, 10. It says how they are going to respond. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on him and look at how it describes him, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn, if you will, the death of a firstborn. How are the Jews going to respond? It says they're going to look on him whom they pierced. That is 500 years before the birth of Jesus. Zechariah tells us how Jesus, the Messiah, will die the first time. He will be pierced through his hands and feet. And they will look upon him whom they have pierced. In other words, the one that their forefathers rejected and sent to be crucified by the Romans. They will look upon him and they will mourn and weep bitterly. Why? Because they're going to realize all this time we rejected our Messiah. He came to that which was his own and his own received him not. Can you imagine being a Jew and thinking how many things we could have avoided in our history had we just received our Messiah when he came the first time? But they didn't. They rejected him completely. But how are they then going to respond? Well, remember, Jesus is going to fight on their behalf and he's going to put down all of their enemies. He's going to destroy all of these armies from all these nations that are gathered against Jerusalem at that time. And you can imagine they're going to know exactly who he is now. They're going to know exactly what he came to do the first time he came when they pierced him. And they're going to realize he was pierced for their transgressions. He was bruised for their iniquities. Right? And... If you look at the first verse of chapter 13, Zechariah 13, look at this. This is one of the most amazing verses. It says, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. In other words, they're going to come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ on that day. The Jews are not only going to recognize him as the Messiah, they're going to recognize him as the pierced one, pierced for their transgressions, who died on the cross for their sins. And the nation of Israel is going to come to faith in Jesus Christ as a nation. They're going to come completely together as a nation and receive 
the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are going to be saved at that time. You know, what's interesting about this is the Apostle Paul knew and understood these prophecies. He was a, he was a student of the Word of God. And he actually wrote about this national conversion of the Jews to Jesus when he wrote his letter to the Romans. Let me put it on the screen and show you. It's from Romans chapter 11. He writes this, lest you be wise, he's talking to Gentiles, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, come into the kingdom. And in this way, look what he says here, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And Paul is quoting Isaiah there. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Jesus is going to come and in a day going to remove the sinfulness of Israel when they receive uh, their Messiah. So <laughs> we, we, we have this huge battle afterwards. The nation of Israel turns to the Lord. They're saved. So what are all the, what are all the events that are going to be leading up to this? Well, the next thing to happen on God's prophetic calendar, I mean, from right now, from, what is it, March, I forgot, 28th. 2021. What's the next thing on God's prophetic calendar? It's the catching away of the church. The Lord comes to catch away his church. We go to be with the Lord. We, we meet him in the air. That ushers in that beginning of that period called the Great Tribulation. Seven years, the outpouring of God's wrath, terrible time on the earth. And in many ways, Israel will be protected in, in some ways, during the Great Tribulation. But again, at the end of the Great Tribulation, the nations of the world under the leadership of the Antichrist come against uh, Israel, specifically Jerusalem, to conquer her. And again, that's toward the end of the Tribulation. The Lord then returns in what we call His second coming. Okay, In the first time He comes, He just comes for His church and He doesn't come to the earth. We meet Him in the air. But He comes to earth the second time at the end of the Tribulation, to battle on behalf of Jerusalem and all of the Jews, to win that battle. They receive him as their savior, as an entire nation. And then what happens? Well, we then move into that period of time. The Bible speaks of 1,000 years of unprecedented peace on the earth. Satan will literally be bound and cast into the abyss for a thousand years, and there will be great peace on the earth, and Jesus will rule and reign during that time, during that millennial kingdom. It, look with me in chapter 14. We're, I know we're bouncing back and forth here in Zechariah, but as I said, these things are not in chronological order. Chapter 14, look at verses 8 and 9. It says, On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, right? On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Guys, this is the final fulfillment of the prophecy that was re recorded by Zechariah, quoted by Matthew, as we read it there in Matthew, when, when he's telling about Jesus coming into the city on Palm Sunday, he says, remember, Zechariah said, behold, your king comes to you. Well, in his first coming, he said, yes, I am a king, but not of an earthly kingdom. He comes a second time and the final fulfillment of Zechariah is completed because we read right here that he will be king over all the earth at that time. All right, now, in this same chapter, I want you to skip down to verse 16. Chapter 14, verse 16. It says, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem, so the people of those nations, their armies will be destroyed, but those people will survive, it says, they shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the feast of booths. Now, this is fascinating. Even during the millennial kingdom, 
Some of the Jewish feasts are still going to be celebrated to commemorate the things of, of God's faithfulness. And Gentiles are going to be invited to participate in some of these feast celebrations, such as the Feast of Booths, when they would celebrate God's gracious provision as the people of Israel were kept by the Lord all those years uh, during uh, the, their wilderness wanderings. And so it, it kind of interesting, isn't it, that during the millennial kingdom, these things will still be observed. Look at verse 17 with me. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So there's actually consequences during this 1,000 year period for those who might possibly uh, refuse to go up to Jerusalem to uh, observe and celebrate these various things. Again, we're talking about the millennial kingdom. It's also referred to as the messianic kingdom. That 1,000 year period of time while Satan is bound and Jesus is ruling upon the earth. Why did I bring all this up? Because it's all foreshadowed by Palm Sunday. Because Palm Sunday is the partial fulfillment of a prophecy given in Zechariah. And Zechariah goes on to speak not just of his first coming, but his second coming and even into the millennial kingdom. So there's much of the book of Zechariah that is still yet unfulfilled, but will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes. And one of the other important and very interesting things that I want to bring up is how Jesus came in his first coming and how he's going to come in his second coming. Because you'll remember Zechariah prophesied, Behold, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. Back in those days, for a king to enter a city that was not his own, if he didn't want to get shot down or whatever, if he came on a donkey, they would know he's coming in peace. So to go into a city as a king on a donkey was a signal, I come in peace. Behold, your king comes to you. He's humble, gentle. He's at peace. That's his first coming. But then we know that Jesus is coming again. Does he ride on a donkey when he comes a second time? Not at all. It's recorded for us in Revelation. John sees this as a vision up on the screen for you. John writes, then I saw heaven opened and behold, a, a, a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, which is another word for crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And he goes on, and he says, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Notice, he's coming into battle against the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All these passages come together from the Old Testament, from the New, to weave for us the understanding of the events that have happened and are yet still to come. Palm Sunday is the foreshadowing of the next coming. The first coming of Jesus was a picture of what he would do to come a second time. He comes gentle the first time. He comes as a conquering hero the second time. He comes first to die and to give his life. He comes the second time to fight on behalf of Jerusalem and the people of Israel and to give salvation uh, to those people uh, as well who are waiting for him. So uh, what an incredible picture. And all from Palm Sunday. Like I said, when I was a kid, it was just going around with leaves hitting girls. But so much, you know, to, 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 to open up the Word of God, to open up the prophecies of the Old Testament, to learn about the interconnection of all of these events that God has given us in His Word so that we might look forward with anticipation and joy and longing for His second coming. No wonder the Spirit and the Bride says, Come, even so, 
Come, Lord Jesus. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to have our prayer team up here to pray with any of you who need prayer this morning. And I want to just encourage you here this week. You know, we, again, we call this Passion Week um, because so many important events took place in this week, starting with today. Our Lord riding into the city, being publicly declared Messiah for the very first time. But again, all the, all the events that are foreshadowed in that, that look ahead to the future. And then we're going to come here to Good Friday, on, on this coming Friday. We're going to have a special service, and I really hope that you guys are going to be able to come. Um, we'll be right here in the auditorium. We're going to take communion, as Sue said. And we're going to kind of just, we're going to talk about the Last Supper. And we're going to talk about the arrest and, and we're going to talk about the trial. And we're going to talk about the crucifixion. And we're going, to, we're going to think through deeply about those events. And then, of course, next Sunday, we're going to come together with great joy and anticipation as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday and life eternal. So we hope you'll be with us then as well. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us this time. Thank you, Lord, for your word that connects the dots for us to help us understand the course of events, the beauty of the prophetic picture of Messiah who has come to bring life. Lord, what a glorious picture it is, and we are so privileged to be a part of it. We rejoice today in knowing the plan that you have revealed to us through your word. And I pray, my Father God, that you would enable us by the power of your spirit to live for Jesus all the days of our life as we anticipate your second coming. We rejoice, Lord God, that you are coming for your church and we long for that day. We commit our hearts to you. Help us to be busy, to be occupied, working for the Lord, serving you with a whole heart until that day. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a good rest of your Sunday.